So next up, we have um, Asta Karlberg, who's Open Forum Europe's policy director. He's actually traveled all the way from Brussels to be with us um, tonight. So we're very great for him, for him to, for coming in. And he's going to talk to us about political challenges and opportunities for open software in, um, in Europe. Esther. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, I worked uh, in a former life, oh, it's not actually not that long ago, as um, a speechwriter. So I have a very traditional way of, of preparing these things for myself as well. Um, but yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I would like to start off this talk with a key question that I've been thinking about a lot for the last two years. Um, so yeah, why did free and uh, free and open source software development end up as an unintended casualty in the original proposal of the copyright directive? And you know, EU politicians rave about the digital transformation, blockchain, IoT, supercomputers. All these words are big buzzwords in the political world, world, and they're all heavily dependent on open source. Yet, when uh, proposing a new copyright directive, nobody thought of software, which is regulated by copyright. Um, or for that matter, uh, the different development platforms that are out there. So simply put, uh, put had open source advocates not spotted the risks, um, the platforms that developers rely on to develop code, uh, GitLab, GitHub, they risk being regulated out of practical existence. Um, and thinking about these questions have brought me to this idea. Um, I guess it's an argument uh, that I will try to make here today. And that is that while the realities of innovation in software has evolved over the years, open source going mainstream, et cetera, uh, policymakers have not kept up in terms of knowledge. This is perhaps not news to anyone, but um, uh, this has also you know, been true for the copyright directive. Uh, it's arguably been true, you know, throughout history when it comes to politics on the technological frontier. Um, there is, which we know of, this knowledge discrepancy in text policy. But what I also would like to argue, which is perhaps a little bit more controversial, is that open source advocacy has not followed the times either. And uh, I'll get into that more in detail at the end. There will be a bit of a narrative arc here, I hope. Um, but I will also stress the importance of uh, open source and op openness advocacy in general, that we really step up our game in the coming years. Um, because with open source going mainstream, there are new risks, but also new opportunities. And the political conversation around open source has kind of gone beyond what it's focused on in the past. Um, we now as advocates, but also the engineers and the community are starting to become acknowledged in some pockets as being of strategic importance for Europe's digital future. And to be part of that conversation, uh, the open source ecosystem and the communities need to build the capacity to become trusted partners of governments and public authorities, uh, because this is needed in order to capture the really big opportunities that are out there for open source. Um, yeah, so before I jump into copyright policy and uh, the different political trains, let me introduce Open Forum Europe, the think tank that I work for. To keep it really short, for the last 15 years or so, we've been, you know, around arguing for the openness in computing to um, politicians and legislators across Europe. We're based in Brussels now, founded in the UK, however, uh, moved headquarters officially last year. Guess why? Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, our vision is to facilitate open competitive choice for IT users that includes open source software, but we also have open standards, which has been a big focus for us through, throughout the 15 years, procurement, cloud, internet, uh, you name it. Where openness is, we try to be. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the copyright debate. Um, it has now become EU law and it's currently being transposed into national law. Uh, and in the last few months of the negotiations of this law, um, it received a lot of public attention. Um, but so maybe some of you here in the audience know the process of the negotiations had been going on for years um, before, let's say, the internet realized. Um, it was proposed back in 2016 uh, and early on critics were, were you know, very fast to, to point out two things. One, that it failed to present uh, you create a real single market, which was one of the main uh, goals for, for um, copyright law. 
But what it really did was that introduce some really far-reaching changes into copyright liability and new rights for publishers. And in, the, in my view, it essentially tried to do one thing. It was strengthening the negotiation position of European rights holders vis-a-vis -vis the large American tech giants. Google and Facebook are the main ones if you look at how the law is uh, written. Um, and it was by introducing mainly the big things that were criticized, the new neighboring right, Article 11, this was called the link tax by critics and a liability shift for platforms, Article 13, and this was called the censorship machines. Um, and in many ways, what we saw was a very technocratic solution by the European Commission uh, to a specific problem which was formulated by the rights holders. Um, and the problem description was li very limited and that is kind of the main problem because I had a few meetings with the commission officials and the lawyers that actually wrote the original proposal they were very skilled IP uh, lawyers. It's not, they're not messing around. Um, but, you know, so in their defense, they were presented with this very limited problem formulation of what the problem with copyright online was, and they solved that problem with this law. The problem was that problem description. Um, so what are the consequences for, let's say, the things we care about in this room? Well, they were first of all, unintended. They were never part of the description of the problem or the solution that, that was put forward. So I'm going to try to keep this really quick, but um, Article 13 essentially introduced a liability shift which would and most likely will lead to um, uh, demands to, for on platforms to mass filter content uploaded by users. Uh, there's a lot of things to say about this, and this is why the Copyright Directive got so much attention, but let's focus on code-sharing platforms for a second. Um, and here, the scary truth, and this is what I will come back to several times, nobody thought of software development platforms. It wasn't disregarded, it was forgotten. It was not part of the conversation. Uh, and the original proposal would have required software development platforms uh, like uh, GitLab, Bitbucket, GitHub to automatically scan and remove code that got stuck in the filters, which could technically uh, break software because software uh, the filtering technology is far from perfect. It has a lot of high rates of false positives. And uh, here it's not, let's say, a video that you take down take up. Some parts of software will be part of a pretty big complex ecosystem with tools interacting. And it's kind of like perhaps pulling out a card of a house of cards. Uh, the challenge was quite great. So, in response to this, uh, OFE, my, my think tank, together with the Free Software Foundation Europe, we launched SaveCodeShare.eu. And um, together with, you know, there is a big network and a lot of people care about uh, free and open source software. There are a lot of activists and advocacy organizations out there and we managed to mobilize them. Um, and we had several meetings in Brussels and we had calls and letters and we organized meetings in the member state capitals, um, you know, from Berlin to Lisbon. Um, we set it up and really worked through the process. And what was very interesting was, and really important also to keep in mind, is that there was pretty broad su uh, support across the political spectrum um, when it came to the critical importance of open source software development. Uh, there was a recognition that it's important that it does not fall in, uh, in, within the scope of the copyright directive. Um, and this is also noteworthy, note, noteworthy because that means that nobody intended, again, to regulate these code repositories. It's one thing in an uh, you know, advocacy fight where you have a clear enemy. Here the enemy was ignorance. Uh, that is a bit more difficult to some extent. Right? It's a different challenge, let's put it like that. Um, so when we did the push, the first step, it gets a bit technical, but we worked through the council. That was the first mandate that came out, um, the first text, uh, the re revised text from the original proposal. Um, we had, we thought we had done our job. Um, we had a, you know, pe you know the, the policymakers seemed to understand what the problem was, what they needed to do. Um, but in the first text that came out after um, the, we realized, even though they wanted to exclude software development platforms, they undermined this commitment. Um, and this was largely due to, uh, uh, to a misunderstanding of the mainstream nature of open source in general. Um, they just threw it in under the things that were excluded that are non-for-profits. There's nothing that, yo, you don't make money of this stuff. So like, 
fair enough. Um, where, so, you know, they only exclude non-for-profit uh, software development platforms. So goodbye GitLab and GitHub and Bitbucket. They're, they were still in. So there are two main observations. They're quite obvious, but they lead to kind of the same conclusion. And um, uh, that I've taken away from this campaign. And the first is simply that it was an unintended consequence uh, or a casualty of the copyright directive. Um, and this, at the same time, in a time when the commission also pushes for European innovation in IoT, smart cities, smart mobility, uh, cloud, whatever, data infrastructures, um, and open source obviously being part of every single part of these efforts. Um, and the second observation is even when they tried to solve it, they didn't manage to get it right because they don't understand the ecosystem. And the conclusion then is simply that when the copyright debate entered the digital space, um, the analytical tools that were, that were used by the policymakers were still very analog. And I feel like this experience gave us a very clear example of policymakers under pressure uh, to regulate the tech industry. Uh, they entered the conversation with a lack of knowledge and awareness and understanding. So fair enough, surprise, surprise. We have a knowledge discrepancy between digital innovation and policymaking. Uh, I, I don't think it's news to anyone. Um, and the problem, and this is what I'm, I'm gonna get to, which is kind of the, 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 uh, the main point of this presentation is that keep in mind that this lack of knowledge has of course created pr uh, problems in the past. Um, you experience a bunch of these problems in your day-to-day -day, uh, work today, I bet. Um, but it will also cause a lot more problems in the future. Uh, and that takes me to what are we like looking at? What's coming now? Uh, what's ahead of us? And I hope that this story of what we did in the copyright directive can serve as some kind of backdrop um, as we look into to, um, uh, the political challenges and opportunities. Uh, and I've divided up opportunities and challenges here, um, but in short, they're all a result of the mainstreaming of open source and it becoming part of essentially every digital development that we have. Because once you get big, certain political dynamics change. So let's go to the challenges first. Um, so the EU governments and the commission, they're stepping up to regulate the tech space. Um, the way it's referred to in Brussels is the age of regulation, at least in the digital policy space. Um, and so now, just a small parenthesis, even if the UK has left, let's keep in mind that what's called the Brussels effect, what's decided and uh, regulated in Brussels tends to sneak in in other jurisdictions as well. So uh, they're not out yet. <laughs> um, so there are big pieces of legislation that are being prepared. Um, a lot of it that gets a lot of attention is the stuff that <clears throat> aims to hold platforms responsible. There's uh, efforts to regulate AI, how data is handled um, as part of large industrial strategies, um, but also pieces in sectors that are now very much digital, be it agriculture, be it uh, smart cities. Um, uh, just I my, my, my boss at Open Forum Europe, Sachiko, she, she said when she started with this stuff, there like, were maybe like two or three digital files a year to work with. Now everything has a digital dy uh, dimension. Um, but so keep in mind that there are all these packages of laws that are being planned to come out, many of them doing this year. Um, and looking at the copyright directive, I think it's safe to assume that there will be unintended consequences. Um, right now, what we, of what we know, the, the most obvious source of concern where we know there will have to be some work done is the Digital Services Act, which is kind of a new horizontal law for uh, platforms. And I won't spend too much time speculating exactly about the details uh, about this. Uh, everybody does in Brussels and it's, it's big, it's like, what is it called? Chinese whispers, essentially. It's hard to know exactly what, uh, who knows what. Um, but um, just keeping this in mind because there's so much regulatory zeal and this together with the lack of understanding of open source is, this is also a very important point that there are just simply new levels of political risk simply because there's more regulation. Um, there's more efforts coming. And um, the sheer amount of regulation then takes me to 
the second point here, which is the digitization of society. Uh, so not just the laws, let's say the actual like efforts and, and goals. Um, but that also means that when there's regulation in healthcare, agriculture, or finance, um, it becomes very difficult to predict where the regulatory risks for open source might come from. Will it be a legal file on dig digital agriculture that puts in certain tricky liability clauses? Um, is it fintech? We, there was a scare here in the UK not too long ago um, with anti-money laundering uh, regulations. Um, so the sources of political risk simply multiply when you get big as well. Uh, and here there's a, a kind of uh, more general point to be made also, which hits close to home to, to my organization, OFE, is that a lot of the <clears throat> regulations that have been suggested, especially from the last commission, we're still waiting to see what we're going to see from the new one, um, uh, ran the risk of essentially choke openness and competition and cementing the roles of big incumbents, um, uh, as they are the only ones that can really cope with the regulation that is put in place. But back to digitization of society, there's another kind of major challenge uh, ahead of us, and it's perhaps the biggest. Um, we had a question earlier about the, uh, let's say, uh, year of the Linux um, desktop. Well, if we find the lock-in of our desktop environments problematic, um, we need to consider the challenge of lock-in when we're digitizing all aspects of society um, and the potential societal consequences of inaction today. There are way greater magnitudes than those of earlier political fights for open source. Um, I mean, we might just lock in everything. Um, and just keep in mind the backdrop, the age of regulation and the digitization of society will be shaped by policymakers that have a limited awareness and knowledge and understanding of digital issues in general, perhaps if we're that critical, but we definitely know that they have a limited understanding of open source. Um, so I believe we have to brace ourselves to, let's say, the slightly more positive part. Um, so just the first thing, um, this is not going to be a lecture on EU legislative processes, but uh, political developments in the EU context goes beyond Brussels. This is sometimes forgotten in discussions. It's a, an exchange between member states, capitals, and the European Commission, and of course, with a directly elected European Parliament. Um, but uh, EU policy uh, was as much done in London as it was in Brussels. Um, um, but yeah, just because they're the biggest ones, and perhaps right now the most interesting ones, I will um, tell you a little bit about what's going on in Germany and how that interlinks with what's happening in Brussels. Um, and it really, something is happening in Germany. In the last few months, the German government and the main political parties have released a set of publications and statements around the concept of digital sovereignty. That's kind of the umbrella term. Um, and in particular, I'll talk a little bit about the Gaia X project. This, a bit simplified, kind of all stems from the fraud trade relations with the Trump administration. And um, this, this iteration of digital sovereignty concept as it stands today in the EU political context was introduced by Emmanuel Macron uh, at his Sorbonne speech in 2017. And what's happening kind of right now with Germany, one could argue, is that they're moving really fast to kind of fill up this concept of digital sovereignty with their own definition that sort of obviously serves their interests. That's not unheard of in the EU context. Um, but at the end of last year, uh, there was a flurry of declarations and reports relevant to open source policy that came from the German government and other parts of, of, of and other German organizations and institutions. So the first very interesting one um, uh, was the Microsoft report. That's what we call it, at least. It's the CIO, CTO of the German government, Klaus Fitt, who essentially released at the highest kind of technical um, bureaucrat level of, of in Germany, uh, a report saying that Germany's dependence on Microsoft Office for that administration uh, undermines Germany's de digital sovereignty. Um, it was, it, we, actually there are a lot of different documents I'll go through now, so I'll, it's a very interesting document, I can recommend it. Uh, you'll recognize a lot of language, but you're hearing it from, let's say, uh, an office that you might have not heard this argument from before. And then there was the Dortmund Declaration, which presented the Gaia-X project. Um, so essentially, the German government proposed uh, a federated data infrastructure or cloud infrastructure with open source and open standards at its core. Um, and depending on who you ask, this is kind of a government effort to create an AWS killer, but um, or it's not. 
who knows, it's still early days. Um, but there's a realization that openness might be key to be able to maintain digital sovereignty uh, around our own digital infrastructures. The penny has dropped, um, it seems like. Um, and we've also heard, and it's interesting with GAIA-X, just to make it a bit more real, because it's still very abstract exactly what it is. Um, uh, we've exchanged quite a lot of information with the, many of the, the open source vendors in Germany that are working with the German government to develop GAIA-X. And uh, what's interesting is that it seems to be a good amount of funding behind it. Um, there are also signs from yesterday's uh, different declarations from the EU that there might be some EU money behind this as well. Uh, but perhaps the most pointed, and perhaps from a slightly unexpected corner, um, Europe's, <clears throat> Europe's biggest party, the CDU of Germany, released a new digital charter. Um, and it sounded like something, to some extent, that a pirate party. Could have released but in slightly different sh you know shades but um it took this concept of digital sovereignty and it refined it by seeing it through the uh, perspective of openness um so it's a pretty unchauvinistic approach to to sovereignty and um they presented their own kind of leitmotif concept uh, called open x um so open everything essentially um and that is the baseline of europe's biggest political party right now. Um, for example, they spell out in this uh, declaration that the party line is that open source software solutions are to be preferred over um, proprietary software in public procurement. This, we're not talking level playing field anymore. It's preferred. Um, so all of this kind of combines, uh, combines into a strong political uh, position. I think it's interesting with what Irina said before, famous you know, celebrities. Germany is generally a celebrity in the European uh, uh, Union. It's good to get them uh, behind you. Not saying that it's all over and done, but, but it, it, it's a lot of momentum. Um, and what's interesting is to kind of take a few steps back and see how they talk about uh, open source in this context. Um, the Germans want to avoid locking to American Chinese vendors to some extent and dependencies. Uh, and this is part of the digitization of society. They uh, want to make sure that they don't build further dependencies on these companies, um, which means that open source is part of a strategic uh, conversation. Uh, it's not money saving. It's not, it's not the point of these conversations. It's deep strategic considerations. And um, a final observation, and this uh, is about the exchange between the capitals and um, uh, the, the, the European Commission or, the, or Brussels, uh, is that they have been working really actively in the last few months to put this very high up on the new European Commission's agenda. So <clears throat> what are they doing? Um, um, well, there's a lot to say Today, uh, yesterday, there were some major documents uh, being, um, there was uh, two communications, uh, one on, uh, was it, a Europe did fit for the digital age, their big strategy document, um, uh, as well as a, a data uh, strategy document and a white paper on AI. Uh, I have them printed out in my bag and there's a, I've skimmed them so far. Um, but um, what's interesting if you look through these, but you, Kind of expected this is that um, concepts or science of digital sovereignty is touching at almost everything. Um, um, it's part of the conversations around the digital tax, um, platform regu regulations, of course, AI and data and the linkages between the two, um, part of their new industrial strategy. But at the same time, um, I, looking through the documents very quickly uh, before 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 this, um, I would say there's still a very long time, a long way to go. Uh, none of these three very important documents mention open source as words. There are some code words that signal open source, um, uh, such as reuse, which is uh, reuse, reusable software is a uh, kind of commission speak for open source in some ways. Um, but uh, for, for public services and government, um, which um, is very much at heart of what the commission does. Um, but in these big strategic documents, the, they were still missing. But so what are they doing, uh, in, in, apart from forgetting to add open source in these important documents. Uh, well, last November, the commission hosted its biggest open source conference to date. It was called uh, Open Source Beyond 2020. And interestingly, uh, the commission expected there to be some interest 
uh, for sure in this uh, in this conference. Uh, but they ended up having, I think, more than twice as many people registering for this than they actually than they could actually host. Um, they added overflow rooms. It still there's, the interest was too 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 massive, and um, this was very much noted by the commission. It was a very good sign that there's activity and interest out there. Um, and this workshop focused very clearly on what the European Commission uh, could do for open source development in Europe, but also, and this is perhaps the key uh, question as well, it's like, what can open source do for Europe, its citizens, its economic growth? Um, what's the exchange? Um, we are now eagerly awaiting the workshop report, which is going to be put in front of the new commissioner. Um, so we're excited to see what they actually have to say there. Um, this um, this workshop, um, two-day workshop actually, uh, was ma uh, is matched with um, the Commission's uh, new study on the impact of open source software and open source hardware on the European economy, its role in competitiveness and technological independence. And it's not the exact title, but more or less. And um, but looking at that, these are strategic questions. Um, they're at a very high level. Uh, what they're looking for. And um, and here is also when it comes to uh, there hasn't been an EU-wide uh, study of open source uh, in the economy. There's been some national ones, um, but there hasn't been one since 2008. So we're quite excited to see what comes out because there have been some developments. Um, but uh, this study, it's it's very it's explained. Um, this is going to steer the Commission's uh, open source policy work for the next five to ten years. Um, so it's a big deal. I hope you are ready to participate. Um, so the kind of very tangible plan now from DG Connect, which is the Department of Digital Policy, one could say, in the Commission, is to host an even bigger uh, conference on open source in 2021 when the study is out, then on a political level, which means that the Commissioner is present. They've already booked the, the Commission's biggest conference venue. They learned from their past mistakes. Um, um, but what is it that the Commission wants with all these efforts? Uh, because it is a lot more activity than uh, at least from the Open Forum Europe perspective we have ever seen before. Um, and I think we were told by a director at DG Connect when he spoke at our open source policy event, which we have every year, right before the Friday before Fostum. Um, also that they send a director. It's also very, an interesting development in this context. Um, the Commission sees it that they want to challenge open source as a community of stakeholders. Um, they, want, uh, they want us, you, to show the European Commission what open source can do for society and for Europe. Um, in some ways, they're asking us to step up. They want us to provide input that is far beyond the, let's say, position papers explaining the four freedoms, level playing field, no offense, desktop software. Um, they want us to explain how open source can play a strategic role in solving the big challenges for Europe. Um, and this is in some ways about getting away from these defensive campaigns, which the, our campaign against the copyright directive was, or the campaign against software patents back in the day was also this defensive campaign, um, to developing the capacity to becoming the trusted partner of government to deliver at a large strategic scale. So the question is, can we do that? And if so, how? Um, and this brings me back um, to the, oh, uh, this brings me back to um, the copyright campaign. And I believe that there's yet another, perhaps more important uh, lesson to be learned from this. And it's that advocates and activists in the open source policy space have to work hard now and take responsibility to educate policymakers in digital. And this means everyone in the ecosystem needs to get more engaged. And uh, the reality is um, that um, as open source software has gone mainstream, uh, it has consequently increased its political power. Um, but most of our open source uh, activism and advocacy looks the same as it did 10, 15 years ago. Uh, there are calls for action online, there are open letters, meetups, and don't get me wrong, this has been and is still extremely important. The community of activist organizations that, fought, uh, uh, f that fight for open source and digital rights is only going to grow in importance in the coming years as we see the rollout of all this regulation. Um, but what I would like to see is open source activism being uh, coupled with very effective open source advocacy. Um, 
And activism is mostly reactive, which you know we saw the massive roar from internet users in response to the copyright directive. Um, but activism of this sort, uh, of this sort, while really important, it's not how you become that strategic partner. Um, so, okay, yes, with our current capacity and the way we work, we managed to get an exclusion for open source development uh, and sharing platforms in the copyright directive. But to be honest, that was also putting lipstick on a pig. It was a very small little pie of the very large discussion. And um, I think that the state of open source policy advocacy um, can always be summarized with the fact that open source software development was an unintended victim. It was forgotten despite its mainstream nature today. Um, also these reactive campaigns, and this is important to keep in mind, I believe, um, the, it was hugely costly and time-consuming process for a lot of volunteers. Um, this should have been solved at the source. Um, there weren't, remember, no opposition. There was no, like, anyone fighting us. Um, this conversation, this could have been theoretically one meeting um, in, let's say, 2014 when they started discussing, uh, maybe we should revise the EU copyright laws. It's one meeting, potentially. But that kind of capacity of keeping an eye on this and having the capacity of analyzing what's coming out um, and being uh, proactive uh, doesn't come easily. Uh, it's up to the community to make sure that history doesn't repeat itself um, and that we're not forgotten again. And this is what I believe what effective and modern advocacy can help doing. Um, seeing all these things coming out, we just have to solve uh, this, this knowledge gap. Um, and the question is then, so how do we find these new ways of communicating? How do we find new ways of making it more effective? Um, well, the first thing is to acknowledge the fact, I believe, that open source software isn't on the fringe anymore. Uh, it's mainstream. Um, and we build the digital transformation of governments. Um, we uh, create the smart cities. It's right there. And the deepest layer of society um, and the EU institutions agree that all these parts are going to be needed for uh, Europe's future competitiveness I mean the, the biggest industrial companies in Europe run open source um, and um, here is just one tidbit that I think could be interesting to consider um, the game changer of the save code care uh, code share campaign that we ran wasn't are open letters, even though I spent a lot of time on those and uh, was a, getting a lot of signatories, etc. Had a lot of meeting. The game changer was when our open letter reached the software team at one of Germany's biggest industrial companies. Um, instead of simply signing the letter, uh, they picked up the phone uh, and they called their public policy team in Brussels. Two weeks later, we saw new text uh, in the uh, in the negotiated uh, legal proposals. Because remember, the member of parliament that was responsible for the copyright directive, he's a pro-industry uh, conservative. Um, used, you have to use the channels. Um, so this is the tool that I would like to offer to anyone that cares about open source software uh, who works or knows somebody who works at um, large companies, small companies, across industrial verticals. Reach out, if you have one, to the policy, uh, policy teams or the, government, the lobby teams, essentially. Build relationships with them. Um, if you're a developer at one of these large companies, take some time and explain and educate their policy and government uh, relations experts. Uh, they often don't understand the importance of software developers uh, to keep their companies uh, innovative. Um, but when, which we saw in this case with the copyright directive, when the public policy teams became educated, um, in this case, which I think is crucial by their own developers, uh, interesting things uh, happened. Um, we need all these teams to uh, be vigilant. So, and if you run an open source software uh, vendor SME, um, are you engaging with um, your national open source business alliance? I know a bunch of you are. I heard that's earlier. Um, questions, are you active in the EU? Um, and one of the examples, you know, that really shocked me when I started working for Open Forum Europe was... Um, um, I asked our CEO, who in Brussels, who's the lobbyist that represents open source businesses? You know, the elevator floor manufacturers, they have a lobbyist. Everyone has a lobbyist. No one, there's no one here 
Um, this is, however, changing, and we can talk about that later, but I see I'm really running over time. But um, if policymakers don't understand your reality as software uh, developers, uh, and doesn't matter if you're independent or a small company or a big one, it is also your responsibility to bridge that knowledge gap as much as it is the policymakers' responsibility to be curious and humble and learn from what you're saying. And this is what I want to leave you with, uh, is that we have to take our collective responsibility to make sure that open source never becomes forgotten again. And um, yeah, when it comes to uh, maturing your advocacy or lobbying capacity and become a strategic partner to Europe's government, uh, I'm now we don't have that much time, but I would be very happy to hear your ideas. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, further thoughts on my own on this, but um, in short, we just need a completely new level of seriousness and a new level of funding behind our efforts um, because the challenges and opportunities are way different now when uh, open source got big. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. I am happy to take any questions if you have any. Oh man, I, I wasn't going to be that, that quick. So, but um, no, I, I, th I think this is really fascinating and really important. Um, but I don't know, like you talked a lot about the open source community needs to kind of advocate and represent itself. And it's like, well, who is the open source community? You know, and it's not very diverse because, it, you know, either it's people within companies doing open source, um, often to further specific goals. Like, and, you know, the way Google does open source is not a, is not a, way that I'm personally very on board with um, in some sometimes and um, because they they have a particular agenda and Europe strategically is literally trying to uh, follow an agenda that's in, in direct opposition um, to to the Google one so it's not going to be much help and who else can do stuff it's people who have very highly paid jobs um, who get to do this on the side for, for free um, so there's a big issue around funding and sustainability of institutions that actually think about things holistically. And I'm seeing Euro the European Commission consistently fail to fund that. You know, what they have done historically is fund very specific development projects. Um, and I think Next Generation Internet is pretty good. But, you know, if you look back, um, Fireware or other such projects were basically won by um, these management sort of consultancy companies that got Telefonica to build some open source from scratch instead of giving money to existing um, existing projects with existing communities and with existing values. And then these things have been abandoned afterwards. Um, no one is investing in the kind of coordination or the ecosystem work um, or really some of the policy and research work that's important. Um, it's mostly just like, hey, build some tech and put an open license on it. And hey, we've got open source. And you know, which is which is a quite a limited way of thinking about things because adoption is much, much harder than just having some stuff on a website with a free license. Anyway, all of this is to say, which I, I it's, it's just a little mini rant. I really hope this isn't online actually now that I've <laughs> realized what I'm saying. But all of this is to say is, is, is um, you know, I think it is incredibly important that we have industry on board, that we start talking to policy ma uh, makers, that we do, um, you know, but but in order for those discussions to be really valuable and uh, well-informed, we have a broader issue of how this is sustained, how this is economically viable, like, you know, who are we actually relying to provide that input? And, you know, how how do we tackle that? It was going to be my question. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, there were like five questions in that question. No, they're all very good. Um, the first thing that it made me think of was um, that um, it's not necessarily like a vacuum will be filled, so to say. Like if the commission wants somebody to talk to, they will find somebody to talk to. Um, to some extent. Um, this is something that we found ourselves a bit at Open Forum Europe. Uh, we have often been called upon by the commission to speak for open source businesses, which we 
don't represent directly. Uh, we don't. We represent our mission and vision, and we don't do what, let's say, a trade association does, which is straight up lobbying for open source businesses. Um, but we, somebody needed to be part of that conversation. We were happy to take part of them, but often with hedging one. We don't represent open source businesses, and we absolutely don't represent the op open source as a whole. There is no representative there. And this is, the commission is aware of this, and then the question is exactly like, how? okay, is, uh, is there a role for the commission to, let's say, fund an effort like this? That's also a bit tricky. Um, uh, they, I know pockets of the commission are really thinking hard about exactly that question. Now, it's Perhaps it's different uh, talking about, let's say, policy recommendation. Obviously, they need to be interlinked and have legitimacy in what the positions they take. But there are efforts for funding, uh, let's say, SME representation in standardization, for example. Um, those sometimes also suffer from the same kind of input legitimacy problems where you can kind of fund an organization that wants to get the input from SMEs, but SMEs are very busy doing their own stuff and not necessarily they don't necessarily have the time to feed in um, to this one organization that is supposed to gather feedback for uh, to standards organizations but um, the question is then also okay who's interested in stepping up it kind of I think depends on the challenge ahead and perhaps I'm dividing it here between again the challenges and the opportunities we have I think it's too much to wish for to have one static council that hey come to us for any question on open source um, and most likely different coalitions will be um, be formed around different challenges and opportunities um, but having a situation uh, let's say if it's another defensive um, effort. Let's say it's the Digital Services Act. There's another risk for software development platforms. It's pretty good to have Airbus come and say, don't touch this. It's about building the capacity that we have those tools to put in if needed, um, because we have those tools now. Um, and I can tell you this much, the lobbyists at Airbus are very well connected um, and they're very good to use when needed. Um, then when it comes to, let's say, building a European strategy for open source as a whole, that is perhaps a more complex question. And then you, you know, the question of representation is a very difficult one. That's why I don't wanna like, we don't have a direct answer of saying like, this is the solution. But there are a lot of parts and, you know, the open source community is also diverse, not just in terms of who it's there. In some ways it's not very diverse. That's, that should also be said, but it's diverse in the form of uh, institutions and organizations that have sometimes different interests also. What's the role of foundations in this conversation? What's the role of the big companies that are mainly users? What's the role of the, the companies that are users but are also really good at contributing upstream? They might have a completely different perspective on things. Um, so I can unfortunately not offer you a solution, but uh, be the, the one thing, uh, it, this might sound like a silly goal, but um, there was a lot of work in the last commission around startups. It was a big buzzword. And around this was created what we kind of call internally, there was an uh, SME reflex with policymakers in Brussels. So when they saw, looked at a, um, a new law coming out, you hear this probably it's the same everywhere, but it was very clear in Brussels. Oh yeah, but what are the implications for, for SMEs for this? What is this? That was just something in the back of their heads. Maybe it's too ambitious to ask that we'll have an open source reflex around everything. But if we can at least reach the point where people associate, oh, open source important, that would be a huge win for the next five, 10 years. Um, and that I think anyone that touches open source can agree on that policy position. It sounds a bit silly, perhaps in low goal, but if we reach that level, that when people see the word open source, uh, policymakers, at least the key ones, and they were like, okay, yeah, let's not m mess with this. That is a huge win, but it will take a lot of work just to get to that point. That's be very quick for the next question. Okay. Right. Um, Craig Allen, Open NMS again. Um, so it seems to me that the problems you're you're coming up against are basically lack of institutional. Uh, Structure around open anime, oh, sorry, around uh, open source. Yeah, yeah, but but and that is a part of the nature of, of open source as well. So, uh, 
I'm wondering, uh, there's two questions behind this. The first one is you talked about digital sovereignty. Well, the problem is a lot of open source originates in North America anyway. So there's that sense of, you know, well, is the intention that we have projects that originate in Europe? Can that actually be done? Is that a policy thing or is that a, a cultural thing? Um, and is it is it desirable anyway that that should happen that that uh, global communities should not you know exist where they exist and we're happy with that. Um, but but behind that the other question is well what is the role that that institutions like universities or even the NRANs that the national uh, communications networks between the universities they have they have a certain it, it, there's a there's an institutional bias towards openness and supporting open source and there's money in those organizations and maybe that those are the sorts of organizations that can actually be advocates in this area sorry that's partly a question part of you no the last part i think that's uh, probably true i mean in many ways you will all always have to deal with kind of proxy representatives um in this area to, in, in some ways um and i mean one of the the I'm taking this from open source to let's say openness generally. Um, uh, libraries are some of the most amazing um, representatives that we have in openness advocacy in terms also of legitimacy. Um, but then the question is also like, what, what, how can we have, let's say, a consumer rights organization arguing for open source? Um, what is the argument they need to understand? It's also educating kind of the middle layer of the the. Um, the policy space of let's say other representatives of other organizations to for them to understand the importance of this and your first question what digital sovereignty yes i think you're actually pointing at one of the i put here digital sovereignty as an opportunity and it's a definitely kind of a janus faced one um and this is very important to keep in mind and i think maybe one of the greatest challenges is to make sure that bulk of the conversation around digital sovereignty going forward will be one around openness. There's one way of saying, yeah, we close the border here. Uh, only what we do here is what we will, will buy or like, etc. Or you have a digital sovereignty conversation that is essentially, well, if you have the source code, you might rely on, a, um, let's say, a consultant from a um, third country because they're the best. But let's say, something in the relationship breaks down with that third country or the company at least you have the source code that you can go to another vendor um, if let's say a country that we're very reliant upon uh, suddenly decides on a political level to stop updating the software that we are so dependent on which never was really considered a real strategic risk but it is today um, then it is very helpful to have the source code um, and this um, is part of many different parts of the, of the political debate right now. But I think your point is, and this is the OFE point of view on this, it's that we do what we can to make sure that the digital sovereignty conversation is not a chauvinistic one. It's an end of the day concludes that openness equates to digital sovereignty because it equates to control. I think, yeah, we're over time. But thank you very much. And, th and thank you for showing some interest in the EU issues. <laughs>